Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 18. As we look at what we're supposed to glory in. Now, the church at Corinth, like many churches, um, had people coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different outlooks on things. Paul, in his letters, spent a lot of time create, uh, correcting their thinking in that... Um, as we've seen, there were some people who got extreme, got off on spiritual gifts to the extreme. There were people who were suing one another. There were just people doing different kinds of wild things. Um, and really, the heart of the problem that they were experiencing there were, was what they were glorying in, what they were getting excited about. Now, to glory in something means that you get all excited and re you rejoice in it, you brag about it. And it's just one of those things that keeps you going. That's the thing you get all excited about. For... These Corinthians, as we said, it was a number of things. They were getting excited about all these different things. At church, it's like coming into the church and, oh, getting all excited about, oh, the worship team. Oh, getting all excited about maybe uh, the pastor, maybe in the way he teaches or, you know, different things like that. Oh, the programs they have, all of those sorts of things. The question comes then to mind, what are we glorying in? So as we study this passage, we're going to see exactly what or who we are supposed to glory in. Beginning with verses 7 through 11, we see that we're not to judge first and foremost by outward appearance. As it says in verse 7, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. What he's saying here, what he begins to say here in the first sentence there as he says, do you look at things according to outward appearance? Now, there's a couple of ways that sentence can be translated. Uh, New King James, King James, some translated here as a question. It could also be a command saying, you know, just look at the way things look on the, you know, on the superficial way and that's on externally. What does it look like? If you yourselves uh, say you are Christ, just on the surface level, think we are as well. Paul is letting the Corinthians know that they're not exercising spiritual discernment, but they're actually walking in the flesh. They were making evaluations by what they saw externally. They were looking at Paul in that way. In fact, from a late second century description of Paul, he's described as being Short, bald, crooked legs, unibrow, with a hooked nose, and some will even say he had a squeaky voice. Like he would show up to the Corinthians and say, oh, hello, I'm your apostle. So it's, you know, this type of thing, and they're looking at him and judging him because of his physical appearance. No one wants to be judged solely by outward appearance, although that's usually the first impression we leave or the first thing that people look at. But we're never to leave it at that. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we um, 
see when Saul was rejected as being king and Samuel was sent to Jesse's house to select someone else to be king, Samuel right away looks at the oldest son, tallest, best looking, and thought, surely the anointed of the Lord is standing before me. But in 1 Samuel 16, 7, we read, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We should ask the Lord to allow us to see people as he sees them, not as just what they look like on the outside, because we can easily be fooled. Now, Paul wants them to consider something since they have this settled sense of assurance as it says that they are Christ. And that was it. They, they were sure they had the assurance of salvation. On the one hand, he may be addressing some of the guys he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 1.12. Remember when he lists, you know, when they were dividing in the faction, some were saying, I'm of Paul, some were saying, I'm of Apollo, some were saying, I'm of Cephas, some were saying, I'm of Christ. And he might be addressing those who were kind of exclusively saying, oh, you know, we're in this group, we're of Christ. So, but it is expected that you should have assurance of eternal life, that you know whether or not you're a believer, that you know whether or not you're saved or not. In fact, in 1 John 5, 13, it says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. It's another thing to think that you have this exclusive relationship with Jesus in the sense that you're superior to everybody else. Me and Jesus, we got it going. You guys don't know what you're doing talking about. Jesus taught that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, what do you have to be? The servant of all. Wow, that totally turns that on its head. Now, in verses 8 through 9, we read, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed lest I seem to terrify you by letters. Now, God called Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus at the time, to be an apostle from the time of his conversion. And you can read about that in uh, Acts 9, chapter, or excuse me, 9, verses 15 and 16. Chapter 26 of Acts, verses 12 through 18. You can read about that. Basically, when Paul was knocked off the horse and was blinded, he goes, he goes on into Damascus. He's led into Damascus. God tells a guy named Ananias to go speak with him and tell him what he must suffer and what he must go through. And he's given the mission then that he's going to be he's called He's being sent by the Lord, and that's what the word apostle means, sent one. He's sent to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the Jewish people in that order of priority. And so that's what he was called to do. So he was given this authority as an apostle over the churches that he established. He would not be ashamed by the accusations of some that he was an illegitimate apostle. He didn't care what they thought. God called him. 
I mean, Jesus speaks to you directly and tells you what you're going to do. It doesn't really matter what other people have to say. He knew who Jesus had called him to be, so he was confident based in the Lord. He didn't want to have to talk to them about his authority, but he wanted the Corinthians to understand that he had been given authority for their benefit. God had put him where he was for their benefit to be able to teach them, to be able to lead them in their relationship with the Lord. And so he says that they shouldn't be terrified by these letters because he was just seeking to build them up as Jesus had called him to do. We should have confidence in our position in Christ and who we are, who he's called us to be. We should have boldness to come before the throne of grace uh, Hebrews 4.16 tells us. We should have confidence in prayer, as 1 John 5.14 tells us. Understand and exercise the authority that you've been given by the Lord. And it could be as a father, a mother, some position you're in, in your job or whatever, to be able to exercise that authority in the Lord for because it's really for the benefit of others. It's not just about you getting a big head in a position, but it's serving. Now, in verses 10 and 11, we read, For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. So the Corinthians found Paul's letters to be effective, but his physical presence contemptible. They thought that he was being two-faced because his personal presentation was not the same as his letters. They were looking more at rhetorical style and the way that he taught in his letters more than the content. That's one thing I hated about seminary was you go, you had, I had two sermon preparation classes, sermon prep one, sermon prep two. And the way they conducted the class, they gave all the classmates evaluation sheets. And so as you taught whatever you were going to teach, the message you were going to give, you think those guys were listening to anything you said? Not really. So it's like they're just judging. They're critiquing everything you do. Oh, he smiled at the wrong time. Or, you know, all of these sorts of things, rather than necessarily the content of what you were sharing. That was a frustration to me all the time when I did that because it's like, you know, you pray and you get a heart for this message to, to deliver and you do it and they talk about what you're wearing, you know, and stuff like that. Oh, that's not the best thing to wear when you're given a message or whatever. And it's like, please. But that's the way these guys were. They were looking for rhetorical style. They were looking how things, you know, in a prideful way, they were looking for things to be impressed by. What was taking place was because they were relying on outward appearance and they were missing the working of the Holy Spirit. They weren't looking for, you know, Lord, what do you have for me? I mean, that's the way we should come into church or anytime we come into a meeting or a service, a Bible study, is to think, Lord, what do you have for me here? Not that the pastor is funny. It's not that he's relatable or all of that sort of thing. It's, Lord, what do you have? See, we should be looking to the Lord in these things and not simply the outward appearances. 
In, in fact, Paul tells the Corinthians or told them previously in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So their focus was to be on what God was doing, not on these external things. But that's, you know, that's a very common tactic that people use. It's a diversion tactic. And we sometimes use this diversion, think we can get away with this diversion tactic with God. When, you know, you're in maybe a congregational situation and the message is convicting and you start looking at, ooh, You'll start looking to find something wrong. So you can go off in some other direction rather than to receive the conviction. But Paul's saying that they wanted him to be tough. Well, he'll be tough the next time he comes. But if ministry is not done in the spirit, and a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit is not encouraged, then people will look to the outward appearance. People will focus on those things. Now, in verses 12 through 16, we see that we're not to compare ourselves to others. As it says in verse 12, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So what are these people in Corinth about? Themselves. He's driving, obviously drove that home. As we have seen, the Corinthians accused Paul of being bold in his letters, but he's certainly saying here that he wasn't as brazen as they are. They set themselves up as their own standard and measured themselves by that standard. They came out pretty good because they were grading themselves on a curve. They also formed these mutual admiration, congratulatory clicks. That's much like Hollywood today. You know, in Hollywood where they have award shows for everything. And it's just them giving each other awards. Oh, it's your turn to get an award this year. You know, and that type of attitude. And that's what was taking place here among the Corinthians. If we measure ourselves by others, we'll either congratulate ourselves because we think of ourselves as better than someone else or we get depressed because we'll think of someone else as being better than us. But it's simply not wise to do either because it gives us a skewed perspective. You get a much better, more accurate comparison by comparing yourself to Jesus. If we would all simply do that, it would set things in perspective. We'd realize that we fall short. And as Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we will do this, if we will compare ourselves to Jesus, then there's one thing we'll find out for sure, and that's that we're in constant need of Jesus. 
and his working in our lives and in our hearts, changing us because we all fall short. Now, in verse 13, we read, We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but with the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. Now, Paul saying, I'm not like these other guys, these Judaizers that we've talked about before, that these people who came from Jerusalem were, and they would come off and follow Paul along. And after Paul left, they would move in and start telling the Gentiles they had to start living like Jews to really be Christians. And some of the Corinthians were buying into this. They would move in on other people's ministries and brag about what was going on there. He wouldn't take credit for what God was doing with other people. Now, I've heard of this. I've seen this before. And that is when people, someone will want to plant a church. What some people will do people of low character will do is they'll go to a church and they say, oh, we just want to fellowship with you for a while until God leads us on. But what they're doing during the time that they're there is they're acting like Absaloms, is that they're going in and they'll start um, talking about how good they are, possibly how Oh, this things could be done better. The pastor isn't quite what he should be. So then they come to the point where they say, it's time to go, and they leave half the church with them. Paul's saying, I don't do that. These guys do that. This is the kind of thing that they do. In Romans 12, 3, Paul says, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now we'll see shortly how this all plays out, but the point here is that given a measure of faith, you've given faith to do according to what God's called you to do. So Paul's saying, that's what you need to be about doing. Not to think of yourself too highly, but according to faith in that, what has God called you to do? You do that. He would only talk about areas of ministry that God had given him and where God was working through him. He would not build on another man's ministry, as it says in Romans 15, 8 through 20. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim, excuse me, to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. He was very careful about this. He didn't want to. He purposefully went where no one had gone before. So the question for ourselves, what area of ministry has the Lord called you to? Allow him to open and close doors of opportunity. Focus on following Jesus and don't worry about what he's doing with others. Like 
Peter. When, after Jesus had restored him, said, Peter, you follow me. Acts, or excuse me, John chapter 21. What does Peter do? Right away, he turns, looks at John and says, but what about this guy, Lord? And Jesus says, if I want him to hang around until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. That's the point. You follow me. Doesn't matter what everyone else is doing or anyone else is doing. That's not to what our occupation is to be, what we're to be occupied with. But Lord, I'm following you. Now, in verses 14 through 16, we read, for we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. The Judaizers, you see, were actually doing what they were accusing Paul of doing. They were overextending themselves beyond the ministry that they had. In fact, they were likely, they were likely, you know, as I said, sent out from or came out from Jerusalem, and they had a preference for ministering to Jewish people. Because the church started all Jewish people. And that was comfortable for them. And they were doing that, but then they see Paul going out and having some quote-unquote ministry success in the sense that God was using him. So what did they do? They tag along after Paul and start trying to make Gentiles into Jews, trying to get them to follow the Jewish religious traditions that they were not bound under. So, now, the idea here, uh, well, they were, again, overextending themselves beyond the ministry that they were supposed to have or they should have and going into Paul's ministry. But the idea behind the language here <clears throat> is that there are lanes laid out for runners in a race. And they need to confine themselves to them to successfully run their race. It's like when you walk, watch a track and field event. You see these guys running around and they're in their lane. What would happen if they kept wandering into other people's lanes? Well, obviously it would take more time. And they certainly wouldn't finish the race well. And that's the point that Paul is making here. In fact, it says in Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Each of us, have a race set before us by the Lord. Our focus, our call should be to finish the race well. In fact, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 7, towards the end of his life, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. See, he had finished the race. He had finished his race. He had finished the course that God had called him to run. And then, and that he could be satisfied. And as the scripture says, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the point is to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But the Judaizers boasted of things that others had done. They tried to steal Paul's sheep. They assassinated his character. 
they assumed authority which they had no right to. But Corinth was in Paul's sphere of authority because he planted the church. It was his responsibility. As they grew in maturity and ministry, his authority could then be extended beyond them. So it's like what he's saying as, you know, he goes, plants that church, they grow in the Lord, they grow in the relationship, they get stable. He can go on to the next place and even take some of them along with them so the sphere of his influence and the spread of the gospel continues. It's important that we know where God has called us and to whom he has called us to minister. Because otherwise, we'll waste a lot of time and otherwise we will not be effective as we could be. If I'm trying to minister to people that God hasn't called me to minister to, it will not be effective. But if I'm ministering to those who he has led me to, he's called me to minister to, then the Holy Spirit will work. He'll move because I'm in line with the course that he's called me to. I'm aligned with what he desires to do. And we could save the church a lot of grief if we would do that. I mean the church, the body of Christ as a whole. If we'll simply do what God calls us to do to the best of our ability as he provides, we'll save the church a lot of grief because we won't be stepping on other people's toes. We won't be, you know, doing, you know, causing unnecessary strife. Now in verses 17 and 18, we read that we are to live to please God, as it says in verse 17. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You don't glory in what you are doing, but what the Lord is pleased to do through you. In fact, Paul, when he was saying this to them, would probably had this one passage in mind, and that's Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 that reads, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight says the Lord don't glory in how much education you have how much power you have what influence you have if you're going to glory in anything if you're going to be excited and rejoice over anything rejoice in the Lord and what he's doing in fact in Luke Chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, we read. Well, let me give you a little background first. This is when Jesus sends out the 70 disciples, two by two. Not the apostles, but 70 other guys that were following him. Sends them out two by two, and they go all around ministering in the cities around where Jesus was. And it says, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord... Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Don't get all excited that demons are running from you and all kinds of flashy stuff's going on because in the scope of eternity, how much does that really matter? But rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. 
If you can't rejoice over that, you can't rejoice over anything. The only thing that is really worth glorying in is your relationship with Jesus. It's the only thing that's going to last forever. Now, in verse 18, he says, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord approves. Or commends, excuse me. It's not the person who praises themselves and their accomplishment that are tested and proved. Because that's what that word approved means. It means to be tested, put to the test, and proved to be strong or worthy. Paul uses the same expression for those who've been tested in ministry. In Romans chapter 16, verse 10, he says, Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. But the picture there is, you know, greet Apelles. He's, been, he's in the ministry there. He's been tested and proved. In 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15, he writes, Be diligent. Or the old King James says, study. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman or a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How is a worker approved? As they rightly divide the word of truth through the word of God. That's how they're showed to be approved or commended by God. It's for God to test and approve a person for ministry. And it's what he says in the end that matters. Paul wanted the Corinthians to respect him, but for their sakes, not just for his. It's kind of like his situation with the Philippians. Paul had been ministering in Macedonia. That's where Philippi is. First place he went to in Europe when he came over from Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey, came over there in Philippi, left there later, and he gets down eventually to Corinth. And the Philippians were sending him support for his ministry there. He wasn't, and as we read in 1 Corinthians, he was purposefully ministering to the Corinthians freely, not raising any type of support, not doing anything like that. And he, in chapter 4 of Philippians, in verses 17 through 20, he says, not that, you know, he wrote to him thanking him, saying it was great that you sent this gift. But then he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek fruit, the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all in abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Everything that God does in your life and through your life is for your eternal good and for his glory. That's the end result, what it's going to be. So, he alone's to receive glory. Never evaluate a person or ministry on the basics, basis of outward appearance. Don't use how you compare yourself to other people and their ministries to justify yourself. It's Jesus 
who will give the, affine, the final authority, or excuse me, the final appraisal at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again so much for your word. And Lord, we talk so much about uh, having a relationship with you, Lord. And as we read earlier, Father, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin, our sin, each one of our sin, is death, eternal death, separation from you. But the free gift of eternal life is through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that if there's anyone here who hasn't yet personally received Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, I pray that you just be speaking to their hearts of their need. And Lord, bring them to the point, again, by your Spirit, where they would confess their sins, as your word tells us to do, repent or turn from their sin and toward you, and to place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Free gift, the offer that you have for each one of us, Lord God. We thank you for that, Lord. And you just pray for each person here. Lord, on the course that you have them running, or they'd experience your presence, your grace, and your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we worship the Lord.